I'm Emma Lubich, and you're watching CAN TV. We're here today with Daniel Espada, Alderman of the First Ward and a member of the Committee on Environmental Protection and Energy. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you uh, so much for having me. Yeah. So over the past week, ComEd has been at the center of the news cycle in Chicago for a massive bribery scandal. Um, this comes at a time when ComEd's current 30-year franchise agreement with the city is coming to an end. So about a year ago, you and 21 other older people called on the city to conduct a feasibility study to see whether it would be financially plausible for the city to buy out ComEd's assets and take over control of the city's power system. So the exploration of public power was being called for a long, long before the depth of the bribery was unveiled. So what did you and your colleagues see as the shortcomings of having privatized power in Chicago? I think at the end of the day, it's about accountability. Um, who is ComEd accountable to? We've seen it in the past weeks. It has confirmed that ComEd at the end of the day is accountable to their shareholders, to their profits. We want a public utility, a democratically controlled utility that is first and foremost accountable to the citizens of Chicago. It's also about some of the things that you can accomplish when you take the profit motive out of it. Being able to invest more in beneficial electrification, being able to actually invest in renewable energy production, the things that we know that we need that are essential for Chicago's health, and particularly for fighting climate change. So the Committee on Environment met on July 30th to question and then hear testimony from ComEd officials. So the feasibility study being conducted by the city should have been completed before the meeting, but the release was delayed due to COVID-19. So you had called on the city to release at least a preliminary draft of the study to alder people and the public prior to the meeting, which didn't happen. Uh, but the commissioner of the city's assets, information and services department, David Reynolds, stated that the likelihood of a city takeover of the system was fiscally unrealistic. So if this is the stance of the city, is there any chance that municipalization could still happen? Absolutely, absolutely. So we know that they've had a study in hand since July 10th. We, we know that they say that they've been studying the financial modeling. To me, that's a very good sign. Because I, I think if something is no chance, the city is very quick to come out and say there's no way we can possibly do it. The fact that we've been studying this for the last three weeks to me is a very good sign. But at the end of the day, it should not simply be up to um, bureaucratic decision makers or even a single commissioner. It should be the decision of the people of Chicago to decide whether we want a public utility, whether the risks and benefits of that are worth it. So I don't think there's any way we can make that decision without a public process, without real public hearings. Comet officials have stated that they estimate that the cost to buy out the assets and infrastructure would be around $10 billion. So with the city's precarious financial situation, I mean, how would we pay for that? The number goes up for them every single time they say it. That's the thing, Emma. The first time I was on Chicago tonight with them, they said it's probably around $5 billion. The, right. the number doubles as a way of trying to get Chicagoans to shy away from this. We know even from the preliminary research that the Democratized ComEd campaign has done that you could bond this out long term against even just what their current profits and revenue are. Um, but the thing is, at the end of the day, we need to weigh this against a robust feasibility study, which we're working on right now, and also what are the long-term gains that Chicagoans can make, not only by getting rid of the corruption and getting rid of the corporate interests that right now we're primarily accountable to, but all of the benefits that can come. I, I want to speak to one more of those really briefly is if you look at the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, odd place to reference in relationship to Chicago, but they have been able to build a startup economy. They've been able to supercharge their economy by investing in municipal public Wi-Fi and internet. We've been having a lot of conversations around that, even around having a referendum on our ballot around that. That public Wi-Fi, 
for Chattanooga would not have happened without their municipal utility. So in a lot of ways, this is uh, a campaign that's in lo uh, aligned with the long-term economic interests of Chicago as well. And so you've called for the city to enter into a much shorter franchise agreement one year, just to give council members enough time to debate the possibility of an alternative with full access to the study. Um, so when would council decide on that? That is going to take another uh, meeting and hearing from the Environmental Protection and Energy Committee, but we think it's the right choice. Uh, the city has already said that they put um, our negotiations with ComEd on hold. They recognize that not only do we not want to be negotiating under a cloud of bribery and cons um, corruption, but we also want to make sure that we're doing this during a time when public hearings can take place, when we're uh, on firm economic footing. I want the same decision-making climate around municipalization. We know we're in really risk-averse times. So let's wait until we're in a sound place in terms of our health, in terms of our economy, to make this kind of big decision. And so talk more about what municipalization actually means. And then also touch on, if you can, democratization of the system, which takes it a step further, essentially. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that differentiation in terms is so important because the, the language we often hear is this is a citywide takeover of comment. And it can sound like we're just going from corporate control to bureaucratic control. That's not something Chicagoans should want. What we're actually talking about is democratic control. We're talking about having uh, what one in seven Americans already have, which is a democratically controlled public utility, where you would have a public electric utility board that is elected by Chicagoans that can actually determine what our priorities should be, both in terms of how our grid is operating, how it modernizes, but also in terms of how we invest. A public utility could really take um, a more proactive front in terms of how we electrify our public um, CTA fleet, in terms of how we prepare for beneficial electrification in terms of more community solar, converting more diesel commercial fleets to electric and the charging stations that need to go with that. But also the fact that a public utility, since it's regulated differently, can move to a progressive rate structure, can actually invest in renewable energy production for the city. These are things that Chicagoans have said consistently we're excited about this. We know that this is essential for the city's response to climate change, but also to like our long-term economic health. So there's a lot that we can do with a public democratically controlled utility that is in the best interest of Chicagoans. And I would say is worth the long-term investment that it would take to procure ComEd's assets. And so there are approximately 2,000 publicly owned power utilities in the U.S. Very few have moved from being private to being public, and definitely none that are the size of the city of Chicago. So what, what hurdles or what would we be looking at if municipalization became a more viable option? Part of this is what we're looking to determine through the feasibility study, right. um, but it involves essentially um, the procurement of comments assets which is essentially the cost of uh, reproduction minus depreciation. It also is about you have to sever or disconnect from their overall network. Um, but that is why like both the feasibility study and its completion is so important and also why we wanted to see it prior to July 30th. If you're gonna have a hearing, particularly a five hour hearing, about the state of our franchise, I think the city really owed it to Alderman to have a draft of that information in front of us so we could be the most informed participants in that committee hearing that we could be. But the chair of the committee, George Cardenas, had pledged even last year 
that we would see public hearings on the feasibility study when it comes out. And so I'm hopeful that that is something that happens, if not in August, then in September. And so what does the continuation of this effort look like for your office? And are there dates, meetings that Chicagoans should be looking out for? I think for my automatic allies and myself, it really involves continuing to push on a weekly basis for the release of the study. I think it's going to be really important to uh, hold the city's feet to the fire to schedule those public hearings, but then also to make sure that we have that one year franchise agreement extension. None of us want to turn around and find uh, a draft franchise agreement suddenly put on our desks in October, November, when, when we're in the heat of budget season, when we're trying to cope with our response to COVID-19. I think having that stability, that predictability of a long-term franchise agreement, uh, well, a long-time extension of the franchise agreement is important. So setting the date for those public hearings and to hear out and pass the council order for the one-year extension, those are the dates that I'm pushing for. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation. And folks who want to learn more about this campaign can go to www.demcomed.org. That's D-E-M-C-O-M-E-D.org. Okay.